Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, today's webinar on uh, for social service providers and emergency responders on uh, Afghan culture and serving Afghan evacuees who have moved to our area. And I'm going to speedily hand it off um, to Rachel and Zala, our wonderful presenters and experts uh, for today. Um, I'm Sarah Bedford. I'm the new American Program Director at Jewish Family Service. And I wanna warmly welcome everybody who is here with us and who's watching the recording. Um, and this session will be followed up by a question and answer session where you can digest the information and then come forward with, uh, with your questions and, and to have a lively discussion with our presenters in about a week's time. Uh, so put that on your, on your calendars. And with that, I'll hand it uh, to Rachel and Zala to kick us off. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone. We say in um, Afghan Dari, Khoshomadi, welcome. Uh, we, oh, we um, of course want to express our appreciation to the Jewish Family Services of Western Massachusetts for recogni recognizing the need to give extra attention to the resettlement of the newly arrived Afghans and for organizing this series of presentations. Really appreciate that you've set aside the time and we hope it's worth your while. Our approach in this presentation is to talk about Afghanistan, the country in general, geography, the ethnicities, religions, as well as family structures, gender dynamics, basic health and hygiene practices, and to focus on social service related issues. Our presentation is about 40 minutes and you're welcome to put your comments or questions in the chat. We'll, have, we'll open up for discussion at the end. And as Sarah said, we'll meet again in a week for further discussion. I always apologize up front for offering a very general introduction when there are so many languages, cultures, religious practices, ethnicities, tribal structures, educational and social and economic class differences. It's hard to give an introduction without generalizing. So not everything we say will apply um, in all cases, of course. Nearly every image we are using is one of our own. We are aware of the many sensitivities that Afghans have around photographs, particularly of women. Therefore, you may see fewer images of women. Actually, we have a lot of images of women. I'll take that back, but we're very careful with them. And we actually are using a few images by the Afghan photographer, Fatima Husseini. And I'm gonna hand it off to Zala to introduce herself. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and um, uh, hi, everyone. And uh, thank you, Sarah, and uh, the organization for um, arranging this. And, and as an Afghan and as an Afghan-American, as a refugee, I feel and I, I understand that it's so important to, um, uh, like when we understand the culture and the values of a, of a nation or of a country, it's we can help them better um, resettle in a, in a new country. So thank you for all your efforts. And um, yes, I'm Zala and I'm uh, actually working also with UCRI, which is a uh, which is a US Committee for Refugee and Immigrants, but in the Finance Department. And also I worked for two months as member of the Welcome uh, at the um, Ford Dex in New Jersey, which uh, our uh, role was to help the Afghan evacuees uh, in different ways. Um, and um, about me, I, I'm from Farah, uh, a, a province in the west of Afghanistan. And um, I have uh, more than 15 or around 15 years of experience in international development with a focus on programs that um, are on human rights and girls' education and women economic development in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in India. And um, I have founded, uh, co-founded a nonprofit um, uh, to provide uh, education for girls uh, and to provide income generation programs for women in Afghanistan. And we ended up, we started with a center, but uh, we ended, ended up having um, that, like expand the work in 11 provinces or cities in Afghanistan. And uh, last year I started a social enterprise, uh, again, to uh, promote women economic uh, development and to uh, uh, create jobs for women. Uh, and um, the, the enterprise produces washable uh, sanitary pads for women. So from one side, we are 
creating jobs for women in Afghanistan. For, on the other side, we are increasing access to this important product and information to women and girls in Afghanistan, which help them with their education, with more like active participation in the public life. And I started right before Taliban <laughs> would come to Afghanistan, but luckily um, because of the need, uh, we re resumed our operations in Afghanistan in, in November, 2021. So yeah, that's that's what I am uh, I have been doing. And so um, yeah, that's my passion to work for either education or women economic empowerment. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you, Zala. Um, and I also want to point out that Zala and I have collaborated on numerous projects, including research on Afghan women's leadership and authority through um, grants through the University of Colorado Boulder, where we're both associated. So we have our fingers in lots of pies together. <laughs> um, my name is Rachel Lair, and my career has been formulated by Afghanistan and its surroundings. I took Persian uh, the dialects of which are spoken in Iran, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan when I was a college student and uh, for no other reason than it fit in my schedule. And sometimes you make decisions when you're 20 years old that take you through the whole of your life. I, um, I went on to pursue language and linguistics for my PhD at University of Chicago. I studied in Iran before the revolution traveled in Afghanistan at that time before the Soviet invasion, and I was awarded a Fulbright to Soviet Tajikistan. I wrote a grammar of a minority language in Eastern Afghanistan, and I spent a great deal of time in rural parts of Eastern Afghanistan. Uh, I was there as a linguist, ethnographer, and also as a friend, I too helped community members start an NGO called Rubia for income for women with a focus on heritage embroidery. And during the uh, years that, um, of Obama's surge, which is 2010, 2011, I also worked for USAID, Department of Defense and State to prepare their staff in Afghan culture before their deployments. So um, as you can see, I have a varied background, often with one foot in Afghanistan and the other in the US. It's that mix of experiences I feel that I bring to this training and the fact that I learned all my lessons the hard way. That is, I have made every possible cultural mistake one can make. I have insulted all kinds of people not intending to. And um, for the most part, people have been very kind and to guide me towards better words, better choices, better behaviors. And I appreciate um, the graciousness of Afghans at every step of the way. Um, being a linguist, I have always a focus on language. So, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, is a generic greeting throughout the Islamic world. It's used in Afghanistan. And if someone says assalamu alaikum to you, the answer is to switch the words around and say, wa alaikum assalam, and upon you, peace. And Afghans in particular appreciate when you use some of the phrases that, um, of their language. Afghanistan is a country that sits on the crossroads of the major ancient cultures between East and West at the heart of the old Silk Road. Its location is defined more by where it's not than where it is. So Afghanistan is not the Middle East. It's not Central Asia, nor is it South Asia. It's kind of bits and pieces of some of them. Population is about 37 million and the capital city of Kabul has four and a half million. Afghanistan has a way of confounding its so-called guests, its invaders, and its occupiers. It's the home of Rumi the poet, the game of polo, and backgammon. It's often described as rough and rugged and unconquerable, and it's also breathtakingly beautiful. The cultures of Afghanistan have been influenced over the years by Buddhist monks who traveled through from the east, the raiding hordes of Turkic tribes from the north, the indigenous Indo-European and Indo-Aryan cultures, and of course, Islam, which has profoundly and repeatedly continued to transform Afghanistan. It's a landlocked country with scant water. All the rivers run through it. The Hindu Kush mountains divide the country from Northeast to Southwest. There's desert in the South and steppe in the North. Many of the recent arrivals are from the Southeastern part of the country. The climate is arid, rarely below 20 degrees. In summer, it can be hot and humid in the east, while dry in Kabul because of the altitude of nearly 6,000 feet. 
Afghanistan is more than 70% rural and most people are subsistence farmers. It takes the work of many family members to make ends meet. In general though, men are responsible for providing financially for their often very large families. This culture of men providing for their families persists in the US uh, where women tend to stay at home. Their families don't want them to go out and work. Most of the time, um, mothers are at home and they're with their kids after school, but the majority are not literate. So it's difficult for them to track progress and to help with homework or get involved with school events. Afghan mothers are often busy with household chores and not all that attentive to their children's needs. That's, it's cultural, I should say. And I wanted to say also, I have a lot of experience in rural Afghanistan. Zala reminds me that she has much more experience in urban Afghanistan and has helped balance this presentation because there are plenty of people who have come who are educated and um, urban. And so we'll be seeing kind of the, the whole uh, continuum of life in Afghanistan. There is a saying, Kabul can be without gold, but not without snow, meaning that snow bodes well for the upcoming agricultural season. Nevertheless, the Northeast winter is longer and harsher than what the Afghans are accustomed to. Child labor is common. In the countryside, children do agricultural work. In urban areas, children mainly work in mechanic shops, convenience stores, or little, little kiosks, um, or sell items in the street. So Afghans do not track their children's movements all that closely. They may leave their kids alone in the parks. They let them play until late at night on their bikes in the parking lots of apartment buildings. And in general, the children are outside a great deal um, as they would be in Afghanistan where kids play unattended most of the time. So for kids who might play in the soccer field in the street or at locations that are not legally permitted, or safe, nobody's paying that close attention, right? Uh, respect for public boundaries and space differ uh, between Afghans and the way things are here. So for example, it's common in Afghanistan to pluck fruit such as apples or lemons from trees or orchards, but here they do not have the right to do so. Um, again, without permission or without thinking, they might pick fruits um, from trees or pick things, flowers out of people's gardens. And um, we have heard about police being called to people's houses multiple times because of this issue. Let me give you a real quick bit of history about Afghanistan. Afghanistan was never colonized by the British, though three wars were fought over their attempts. This continues to be a point of pride among the Afghans. So Afghanistan's borders were determined during the late 19th century where Russian and British colonial powers were vying for territory, influence, wealth, and resources, and they battled what was known as the Great Game. Afghanistan was conquered by neither, but had its borders defined as a buffer zone between the two imperial powers. Political conflict in the 1970s led to the Soviet invasion in 1979, which drove over 3 million Afghan refugees into Pakistan and gave rise to numerous Mujahideen factions bolstered in Pakistan and funded by the US. The US proxy war ended with the Soviet withdrawal in 1989 and the US interest in Afghanistan evaporated along with it. A civil war raged among the Mujahideen factions until 1996 when the Taliban movement rose in response. Their Islamic emirate came out of the Islamic schools, madrasas that educated Afghans in Pakistan. They put an end to the civil war, but they created a pariah state, plunging the country deeper into poverty and isolation. This ostensibly ended with the US invasion in October, 2001. Afghanistan, as you can see, just if you look at the colors on this map, is, <laughs> has numerous ethnicities and languages and tribal and non-tribally organized groups. The languages have roots in Indo-European Indo languages, Indo-Aryan languages, and Turkic languages. 
Um, none of these languages are related to Arabic, although they share um, a modified form of the um, writing system and that confuses people sometimes. The dominant political group and perhaps the largest ethnic group is Pashtuns. They're shown in green on the map and their language is Pashto. As you probably have heard, the Taliban are predominantly Pashtun, but so have been all the monarchs and elected presidents. So Pashtuns are Sunni Muslims. Um, the largest concentration is in the Southeast, which is where many of the um, the evacuees have come from. And as you can see, and the reason I like this map is that you can see the uh, affinities over the borders. So a good portion of Pakistan is also Pashtun. Pashtuns also speak Dari. Many Pashtuns also speak uh, Dari. So the next in population um, size is the Dari speaking group, also called Tajik or Persian or Farsi. They too live throughout the country and are mostly Sunni Muslim. And you can see them in the blue. Blue, purple, purple, yeah, purples. Um, then the Hazara, um, another ethnicity, makes up only about 9% of the population. They mostly live in that central kind of purplish area where you see Bamiyan on the map. Um, they speak Dari or Hazaragi, which is a dialect of Dari, and they have been considered the most marginalized group politically and socially. They mostly practice Shia Islam, and because of that, they have been persecuted by uh, various warlords, governments, and most recently under the Taliban with massive genocide incidents. Many fled to Iran during the past 40 years of conflict. They also migrated to Pakistan at the turn of the 20th century and are now, many of them are Pakistanis. Then in the North, there are Uzbeks and Turkmen and Kyrgyz, and in the East, and those are Turkic speaking people in the East are, um, Nuristanis and the Pashai speakers that are the minority. Over the years, many of these rival groups have competed over land, resources, and power. It has contributed to cycles of conflict and dissonance between and among tribes, and loyalty tends to be to kin, ethnicity, and tribe. So in places where resources are limited, competition is fierce, and everything is a zero-sum game. There is only one winner and all the rest are losers. And this, this is an, uh, a recurring theme among Afghans and in Afghanistan. There is no concept of a rising tide lifting all boats. It's also the case that prejudices and rivalries between families, tribes, and ethnicities are not left behind in Afghanistan. They bring them to the diaspora with them naturally. Just to point out, there's an Afghan, there's currency that's called Afghani because I'm a linguist and I like to get the words right. Afghan society is steeped in Islam and it is the central organizing principle in most Afghans' lives. The one thing that is common to all Afghans is their commitment to Islam as both a belief system and as a social program. The idea being that a unity of belief is linked to collective well-being, resulting in social order. So Islam brings a strong sense of morality. Sunni Muslims make up 90% of the population, Shia Muslims about 10%. Both Sunni and Shia follow the religious texts of the Quran and the Hadith, that is the words and the actions of the Prophet Muhammad, and the five pillars of Islam, prayer, charity, fasting for the month of Ramadan, the pilgrimage to Mecca known as Hajj, and the declaration or the profession of faith known as the Shahada. The virgin birth of Jesus is upheld in Islam, and Jesus is considered the penultimate prophet in Islam, mentioned throughout the Quran. Mary or Maryam is revered as well. So Islam pervades all aspects of life. People quote the sayings, they share the stories, some people pray multiple times a day, some people don't, it's their choice. Clothing is Islamically informed, so modest and loose fitting in general. Those things that are halal, permissible, from marriage partners to foods are dictated by Islam, and those things that are haram are not permissible, such as foods, no pork, no alcohol, for example, and many other aspects of social interactions and life cycle rituals are dictated by Islam. So I just wanted to point out that the issue of pork is a major issue of concern for Afghans. The message from home that children receive is that everything in school is haram, not permissible to eat. So often children go hungry all day in school and are scared to eat anything. 
Um, it's also true that adults um, who might be concerned about what food is being offered in a variety of contexts, such as mixed social gatherings, school events, or even invitations to dinner might be very reluctant to eat. In addition to which it's polite not to accept food immediately, <laughs> but it's hard to know always. Um, mosque attendance is a male activity rather than a female one in Afghanistan, particularly among the Sunni Muslims. The Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar, and there's also a, a solar Afghan calendar just to complicate things. The dates for Islamic holidays do not line up with the Gregorian calendar. This year, Ramadan began on April 3rd and ended at the beginning of May. Ramadan is a month of spiritual re reflection and fasting from sunup to sundown. Many families get up before sunrise to have a meal, um, and then they don't take water or food the rest of the day. Um, until the evening meal, which is called iftar. And iftar is celebratory and people visit friends and relatives and children receive new clothes and gifts. And it's totally appropriate to say Ramadan Kareem, happy Ramadan. Uh, when children choose to fast, well, I mean, often they're not choosing to fast till they reach puberty, but some might choose earlier. It certainly would impact their um, school attendance and their performance. Um, the same for people who are working through Ramadan. And because it moves throughout the calendar year, um, in the heat of the summer, when the days are really long, the fast is that much harder and um, certainly gets tempers flaring. So Ramadan ends with the Eid al-Fit, the, the festival of breakfast, and it's people give gift baskets of sweets and candies and say Eid Mubarak. Children receive all kinds of candies or ED, which is uh, in the form of gifts uh, of um, cash from guests and elder members of the family. There are other holidays, but I'm not going to talk about them because um, nothing is coming up soon. Uh, and we've just had e uh, this Eid holiday. Birthdays celebrations are not so customary in Afghanistan. And until recently, and in many cases still, births are not recorded officially. And Afghans often estimate their age and choose their own birth dates. So Zala tells me there was a joke um, on, at Fort Dix that they would have a big birthday party with a big cake sufficient for everyone whose birthday was January 1st, because January 1st is a very popular day to choose as your birthday. Important core concepts that are organizing principles in Afghan society also include honor, family, and gender roles. Afghan communities, especially the villages and the rural regions, tend to be self-governing. There has never been much reach of the government into the rural regions. The government is seen as corrupt, rapacious, unreliable, and unavailable. So the lack of services from the central government is not new. It's always been that way. And suspicion runs high of government representation and authorities. Therefore, Afghans prefer to avoid authorities and manage their affairs themselves. Developing trust and positive relationships to government representatives and authorities will be new for the Afghans and it will take some time. Afghans may not obey laws regarding child protection and child safety. For example, car seats, seat belts, squeezing many children into the back of a little car, which is how they do it in Afghanistan. Many don't understand or appreciate the way our regulations and laws are structured as protections. Much social behavior is influenced by Afghans' awareness of their personal honor. Honor refers to a person's reputation, their prestige, and their value. It's how they are perceived by the community. A person's reputation precedes them in all things, and I like to think of it as a wheelbarrow. So generations of their families are riding up front in the wheelbarrow with all their honor and piety and wealth and largesse and humility. So an individual, is responsible for all of that when he or she goes out into the world. And people are known by their family's reputations. And when an individual, so an individual always embodies much more than just their individual self. And then they put their reputation on the line, they're putting their family's reputation and their, their past family and their future family's reputation on the line. So most Afghans consider a person's behavior to be reflective of the family. When a person's behavior is perceived to be dishonorable, their family shares the shame. If it occurs in the wider sphere, the dishonor may implicate their ethnic group, tribe, or religion. So preservation of honor and community opinion is often at the forefront of people's minds. It influences people's behave, 
to behave conservatively in accordance with social expectations and to avoid drawing attention to themselves. Um, thus, there is a strong culture of judging, I guess is one way to say it. For example, uh, Afghans will look at people with blue or pink hair or tattoos and uh, laugh at them and judge them harshly. Uh, the senior male of the family is responsible to protect the honor and the well-being of the family, particularly in the ways that it concerns the behavior of women around the way they dress, their social interactions, education, work, and public presence. So it can be seen as a loss of honor to the father, the brother, the husband, if a woman does not comply with these expectations. Thus, Afghans are acutely aware that that projecting dignity and scrupulous protect, protecting the dignity of others is essential for good communication. Another example um, that comes up is that teenage boys often display strong reactions or feel provoked to protect the honor of Afghan girls in school. If a non-Afghan boy takes a picture of an Afghan girl or even smiles at her, tries to talk to her, the Afghan boys will call that boy in the park after school. They may start a fight, it may just be a warning. It could go bad. Knives may come out. These are incidents that we're aware of. And um, they say they are doing it in order to protect the honor of the of the all Afghans, you know, through this protection of the Afghan girl. With respect to the family, the core notion of public versus private is a play. Private is both physical and social, so the family matters are part of the private sphere. An Afghan home is like a fortress. Uh, this is in the countryside, surrounded by high mud brick walls. Social space faces the courtyard. There are no windows on the outside of those walls. So um, even in Afghan houses in the diaspora, there are often heavy curtains to shield from outside people to look in. Often multiple generations will live in this space and uh, a family may have a, a room or two for a nuclear family. And the children are raised by most of the women in this area. There's very little privacy um, in Afghan households. And by the same token, social isolation is considered severe punishment and the notion of time out would be considered cruel in these contexts. In urban areas, space is limited and people live in small compounds or in apartment blocks. Many Afghans in the US now are living in crowded apartment settings. And when they talk loudly and argue or are violent towards each other and their children, the neighbors of course will complain um, about negligence, domestic abuse and child abuse to the authorities. Uh, these are all acceptable behaviors in Afghanistan. So there's a, um, quite a mismatch there. They, Afghans may not pay attention to residential compliances, such as they might be washing things and toss it out the window. It's been known to happen, throwing things out, which of course will disturb neighbors or quiet hours or you know how parking spaces work. All of those are just don't register, I should say. They may start fires in parks to cook kebabs, not knowing what the restrictions are. And we've heard of numerous um, examples of Afghans facing legal and social issues in these kinds of circumstances. For example, another story was an Afghan woman, she had a knife in her hand and she was standing at her door shouting at her kids and cursing at them. In Pashto, the neighbor calls the police because they think that she's threatening her children with a knife. Similarly, we heard of another woman who was arguing with her husband outside her apartment um, and saying that she would put the house on fire and she would burn everything down. And of course, the neighbors, when they found out what she was saying, they called the police. Um, and another um, example, some of these women make friendships with their American or you know their non-Afghan neighbors and share their personal life stories. And if they were having a hard day, they might complain about their husband um, being physically abusive to them or that they, he wouldn't allow them to do something or whatever. And often the neighbors will have report to the police um, about a child, considering it a child abuse or domestic case. And then of course the woman will deny everything when the police come and later of course feel betrayed by that friendship that she thought she had with this American and you know, taking that risk of developing that friendship and then being betrayed by it. So these are just some, a few of the instances that we've heard about. 
women's sphere is in the home. So they're in charge of the domestic chores, the cooking, the cleaning, the raising the children, preparing food for guests. And there's of course a hierarchy here too with the mother at the top and delegating tasks to her daughters and daughters-in-law. The newest bride is the lowest in the pecking order. And families that maybe not so much here, but certainly um, in Afghanistan live in multi-generational households. So here are girls. One of the reasons girls don't go to school, just one of them is that they have a lot of responsibilities around the household. And it's and girls um, ha have most of the um, household tasks in Afghanistan. They're also in the US and the European diaspora have a lot of the household chores that are expected of them as well. Laundry is done by hand and women prefer to do it themselves at home. And it's a point of privacy and um, pride to do their family's laundry and the laundry of their guests. Afghans don't like to use laundromats. They don't like to take their laundry to public spaces. So someone told me that, um, that a small portable washer that isn't very expensive would make a great gift if anybody was looking for something like that. Um, Afghans don't typically change their clothes all that often or wear pajamas to go to sleep and personal hygiene can be problematic here. And it comes at a high cost in Afghanistan where water is scarce and heating it requires precious fuel. In some areas too, pregnant women believe it's bad for the baby um, if they shower, if they wash up even. But as you can see, conditions differ greatly in urban settings and the evacuees I think Zala's here in this place. Yes. <laughs> and, and evacuees um, here come from both urban and rural backgrounds and there's just such a big difference. Um, much of the housework, as I said, still falls on girls. Babies are typically swaddled like this in this kind of uh, sash uh, for most of their first year. Coal, which is a, uh, not charcoal, it's called coal, is rubbed into the eyes to make them look attractive. People think it's good for them. And um, Afghan women are often valued by the number of sons they produce. Afghan families and rural ones in particular tend to be very large, six to 10 children. Most women give birth alone rare, in Afghanistan, rarely in hospitals, rarely with midwives. Maternal and infant mortality is quite high. So um, few women have access, particularly rural women have access to prenatal care in Afghanistan and many will have experienced it here on the military bases for the first time. And some of there are lots of concerns I've seen with social services about using this kind of sash to wrap babies up. So it's an issue. As I said, men's roles are chiefly outside the home where they're responsible for the economic well being. Um, sometimes women in the countryside might do some tailoring or, um, or uh, embroidery food preparation, something like that to earn a little extra income, but basically the, the uh, responsibility is on the men. And the same thing is true when they're here and family structure tends to be traditional patriarchal where the decisions are made by the father or husband or oldest son. Um, although much of this is in flux, particularly among the urban and educated, it's not so much in the countryside. And most of the rural Afghans I know who've emigrated to the US and the European diaspora follow this pattern as best they can. So in many households, women are still expected to stay home. And it takes many years of resettlement before they can learn the local language, go to work, or even learn how to drive. Past times in Afghanistan and here are mostly very social such as visiting families and friends, stories and gossip are shared and gossip is considered a national sport by some. Dry fruit and nuts are served with green tea and cardamom at any time. And Afghans often have a large pump thermos for keeping it going all day. And as Zala said to me, many of the women go to the parks with their big pump thermoses and drink tea in the parks while their kids are running all over. Pets are uh, usually birds of some kind. And here this boy is keeping doves. Um, Afghans do not keep dogs as household pets. They're not a member of Afghan families. Um, they're considered dirty. If, if Afghans are keeping dogs, they're keeping them outside the home as guard dogs, or actually there's a whole fighting thing that goes on in Afghanistan. So what might happen, if not only are children and often adults afraid of dogs, but they may harass dogs and throw stones at them um, in public. 
Children show deference and respect to their elders. Even when grown up, they expect their parents to have the wisdom and know what's best for them. And they tend to respect their parents' wishes. And this often extends to marriage partners. Most marriages are arranged by the parents, but not all. Arranging marriages, celebrations of engagements, entertaining guests are hugely important to Afghans. In some cases, parents engage their babies to each other to solidify bonds. In other cases, individuals find their own mates in love marriages. There's a considerable range of attitudes among Afghans toward education. Uh, in rural areas, there's a widespread reserve about education, especially for girls, and it's uh, limited and low by comparison to the US and other places, and lack of literacy is commonplace. Schools are for the most part gender segregated. Afghan parents are not typically involved in their children's education, although teachers are held in high regard. Corporal punishment is used at home and in school in Afghanistan. And for those who haven't previously attended school, taking turns and lining up all of those are new issues for them. And uh, school is not compulsory in Afghanistan either. So attendance is really spotty there. It can be, I should say. Not knowing the right answers could be seen as a personal reflection of weakness. And as I said earlier, could reflect negatively on the family, the tribe or the ethnicity even. So being able to admit not knowing the answer will come at a high cost. And you may, uh, teachers may find that students are shy to raise their hands, share their concerns, or even ask a question because they're concerned about how they're going to be judged, how other people will think of them. Education in Afghanistan is mostly mo uh, rote memorization and not about abstract reasoning and critical thinking. So it's quite, a, it's quite different. After school activities such as sleepovers, not likely, especially for girls and teenage girls may already be engaged. Dating is forbidden. Uh, bullying is an issue that has come up with the Afghan students. Uh, girls wearing headscarves or certain kinds of dresses are, are being have been bullied in school. So then they don't want to wear the scarf, but of course their parents want them to wear it because it's part of their cultural practice. And so it really causes a lot of stress uh, about their identity and feelings. Um, and because children spend so much time in school, they're of course influenced so much by those around them. So I was told this story about a little girl who, um, who asked her aunt who wears a headscarf not to pick her up from school. She said, you, you wear a headscarf and it makes you look ugly. And so she actually went, was hiding from her aunt because she didn't want the school and her friends to see her aunt when she picked her up. So it was really um, quite a stressful issue. And teenage girls um, may like, you know, 14 or up may complain to social services and schools about the certain restrictions at home. And when social services comes to the parents to investigate, the girls are forced to um, deny that anything happened. And it's just, um, it's very common. And it, it's going to just, there's gonna be more and more of this coming up we think. While some changes have happened over the past 20 years of US coalition involvement in Afghanistan, those changes apply less in the rural areas. Um, during the previous Taliban regime, women were subjected to strict dress codes and excluded from working outside the home. They were denied access to education and healthcare and had limited mobility. And we don't expect any better from the Taliban now. But in general, Afghan, the Afghan, is a cons Afghan, Afghan society is conservative and women and girls have always been limited. Education is limited to primary school. If at all, it is the preference that women not be seen by men outside the home. Thus the, um, all the eyes on this woman as she's walking down the street, you know, attracting a lot of attention. Afghan women are typically accompanied by a mahram or a male escort, and you would certainly find that going to the doctor or going with social services. Um, although women have fought hard to gain legitimacy and authority in public decision-making in Afghanistan, there's, women are obedient to their fathers, brothers, and husbands, and women will often not speak before men and may not speak at all in male presence. That's really typical. I've spoken to many accomplished women in Afghanistan, activists, ministers, business leaders, and um, they always emphasize how their fathers made sure they were educated, pointing out that this is the exception, not the rule, Zala being one of them as well. 
his father really made sure that she, she was educated. Socialization outside the immediate family tends to be gender segregated. Men socialize with men and women with women. Of course, this is not across the board with urban and educated. There may be some public formal mixed socializing, but generally not. Men hold hands with men. It's a sign of friendship. Women are affectionate with women. I would caution you um, not to put out your hand to shake someone's hand cross gender just because it might be a very uncomfortable situation. If a man doesn't want to shake a woman's hand, it doesn't mean that they disrespect them. It's actually often considered a sign of respect. So we might read that wrong, but in any case, keeping your hands always to yourself, which I'm sure you all know is really important um, with respect to Afghans. So communication I wanted to talk about for a little bit um, is that um, the difference between American style of communication and Afghan style of communication in the US, we consider ourselves a low context society. So we rely on very explicit communication. We're not relying on implication. So we need to have everything spelled out for us. Don't make any assumptions that anybody knows what you're talking about. Uh, we're direct and we tend to be focused on the person who's speaking. We're not all that great at reading nonverbal expression. Afghanistan is a high context society. Meaning is often embedded in socio-cultural socio contexts, and so much is communicated implicitly. So everybody kind of knows what everybody's talking about. Sentences don't get finished. You know what I'm talking about. You know, it's kind of uh, hidden messages a lot and conspiracy theories. And um, because it's so important to preserve the dignity and honor of the person you're talking to, people are very careful to avoid direct criticism. But by the same token, admitting that you don't have the right answer or that you don't know something can cause a loss of honor. So people are very, very careful. It's hard for Afghans to ask for assistance, especially in front of other Afghans because it shows weakness. Um, and uh, if someone, um, if you ask someone if they understand what you're talking about, you might embarrass them. They're always going to say yes, even if they don't know. So trying to triangulate, you know, to make sure that people do understand can be um, quite, a, quite a challenge sometimes. I find uh, Afghans to be incredibly gracious and polite although they don't say thank you all the time, unless they've learned that from us for every little thing. They might say, may you live a long life or God go with you, but it's not a thing to say thank you for everything. Afghans provide tea and a sweet as the most minimal gesture of hospitality. So accepting or offering tea is proper etiquette. You don't have to drink all the tea, but you really shouldn't refuse it because it could be seen as an insult. And insults are taken very seriously. And uh, not that you will insult Afghans, I've done this, but mostly not. But um, amongst Afghans, revenge can, uh, insults can, will be avenged. And so one has to be very careful. There's a great expression someone once said to me. He said, Americans have watches and Afghans have time. I know this expression has circulated around quite a bit in reference to the Taliban. They were just waiting out the Americans who were on the clock. But it also has to do with the different structures of our societies. Uh, we, uh, US society is highly commodified, monetized, and punctuality matters. You know, time is money. It's not a shared notion in Afghanistan, and this is a big challenge for people. Time is viewed much more flexibly. Bedtime, not a thing so much. Parent-teacher meetings, doctor or job-related appointments, getting to school on time, excused absences, all of these are challenges for resettlement. So um, it's often parents might be one or two hours late to pick up their children from school. And the teachers are pretty frustrated because they have to stay there. Somebody's got to be there till parents show up. In Afghanistan, kids show, you know, may walk a couple of miles to school by themselves and then wander home on their own. So this uh, importance to, uh, to time specificity is not so important to Afghans and can get them in trouble in some ways. So I wanted to summarize some of the social service issues we were talking about. Um, attitudes and perceptions of parents towards education play a key role in how they will handle their children's schooling. 
perceptions about private space, respecting private property and boundaries, public displays of argument, violence and threat are normal in Afghanistan, but of course not acceptable here. And the educational systems differ between the US and Afghanistan. Children are not required to attend school in Afghanistan and with large families, typically eight kids, it makes it hard for parents to actually pay attention to each individual child. Um, mothers do not feel responsible for their children's education or other aspects of their well being. That's customarily the father's role. And many mothers are non literate and they don't have the skills to support their children's needs here. They often leave their kids alone in the parks or let them play until late at night. And in general, they're outside the home and um, in places that maybe not be safe or legally permitted. Parents don't respond in a timely fashion to emails, phone calls, follow ups from school, health, and social service providers. And this is, is supposed to be the father's task, but he's so focused on paying the rent um, that he can't, you know, these things can slip and he may not have the literacy, literacy skills to follow up either. Bullying, I I am quite concerned about kids being bullied for wearing, for girls in particular, for wearing a headscarf or, um, or boys as well. Um, and similarly, as I mentioned, that Afghan teenage boys feel compelled to protect the honor of Afghan girls, especially with respect to non-Afghan boys, and this may lead to injury and violence. As we near the end of this talk, I wanted to um, turn to some aspects of domestic life that might be relevant to you. So one of the best ways to bond with Afghans would be over food and sharing cooking or a meal together would be a terrific. Um, Afghans often will eat um, with a tablecloth on the floor, big pots of rice, and the style of eating is actually with the hand. Um, so for Afghans, getting used to an American kitchen could be quite challenging. Um, and also because Americans tend to use packaged food, Afghans are used to buying fresh food and having and knowing what exactly is in those ingredients are very simple. Um, so things, um, you know, those things could be challenging, especially if they're getting food pantry type stuff. Takeout is quite reluctant, although Afghans prefer their own cooking, no pizza, of course, not with sausage is enjoyed by all. Preventative medical care, dental care, eye care, exercise, heart healthy eating, not to mention mental health are all new ideas that will take time. Afghans have a very strong sense of fashion as much as anyone does. And used clothing is not always a popular choice. So a friend of mine was telling me how she uh, uh, it was winter and everybody wanted to give her their old coats. And um, she was um, insulted that people thought that she might want their old coats. And she actually had her mother send her coat from Kabul because it was the fashion that she wanted to wear. It was her aesthetic. Whether a woman wears a headscarf or not, these are personal and family decisions and can become contentious in certain surroundings. So in summary, family is paramount. Protecting dignity and respect is very important and is at the top of people's minds. Gender roles and relations are distinct for men, have a public life and economic responsibilities. Women have home-based lives. Um, a strong sense of honor, um, hospitality, loyalty, modesty, all are highly respected. Communication is indirect and protective of the speaker's and listener's dignities. Time orientation is different. And it goes without saying, because I haven't even brought it up yet, that Afghans have experienced tremendous trauma, 45 years of war, broken promises, displacement, weak government, untrustworthy authorities, so it contributes to uh, so many of the personal and social problems that Afghans experience. So I want to leave it here. Um, if we only have a few minutes left, because each time I do this, it gets longer somehow. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but maybe you can um, speak to some of the experience you've had, some things, some perplexing communications. But I know that we'll meet again next week to um, to, to so that you all can kind of mull it over and see what comes up for you. So I'll, I can stop sharing right now. And 
Anybody have any questions or comments? This would be great. Have you had complaints from parents or complaints about parents? Safety concerns? Hi, this is um, Anna Marie. I'm, um, <clears throat> I apologize, I didn't join until later, but I'm really glad I was able to still make it and hear part of your presentation. Very informative and very interesting. Um, so I apologize if my question um, you already addressed, but some of the, um, is this applicable to or general, generalizable to, you know, all Afghans or, are there, you know, differences between more more rural versus urban? Um, different, you know. I'm just curious to see, you know, how generalizable is 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 these characteristics and things that you've described. So some of the things um, I describe are very are generalizable across the board. Uh, although I always caveat by saying I don't like to generalize across the board, but um, some things are much more of an urban, uh, a, a, a rural issue and others are an urban issue. So if you had something specific to ask about, but things about communication styles and things like that are quite general or you know the notions of dignity and honor and uh, gender roles are across the board, I'd say. Zala, do you wanna say anything about that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, uh, first of all, like 70 or 80 percent of Afghanistan is rural. And most of what we uh, presented here is more like a reflection of like life in rural, but things like honor or uh, respect and uh, even in terms of time management, that's kind of like you can see in both urban and rural areas. Uh, but in terms of, of course, quality of life, uh, examples such as like taking care of like children or like parenting, these are of course better than rural areas because of the resources that they have and the literacy level. So people living in urban, um, even people living in like rural areas, but they are literate, right? So it's more that with, to do with the education and your economic uh, um, situation when it comes to parenting or um, children and even domestic violence, I would say. Um, and also there are differences in terms of like um, gender roles that is a thing in Afghanistan. It's so important, like uh, what women should do and what men and what's respected, all of that. It also differs a little bit across different ethnicities in Afghanistan. For example, Pashtuns are more like conservative and everything, especially when it comes to women uh, compared to Tajik and Hazara ethnicities. May I ask a question? Uh, we have DTA here and emergency responders. What is, what does, are there social safety nets in Afghanistan or in terms of dealing with a system like the welfare system in the United States, are there systems that could be compared to this system, you know, the bureaucracy and the, the sort of complexity of, of the system. And same question in terms of emergency response, like police, fire department, um, are there sort of parallel uh, systems or situation or helper helpers um, in Afghanistan? Well, uh, there are government institutions or public institutions that in both in terms of capacity and resources, uh, uh, they are not like because of lack of resources and lack of capacity, which is both financial and human resources, they are not functioning very well. Um, uh, especially things like police or fire department and all of that. But during the last 20 years, what Afghans are more like... Um, uh, have seen as that kind of support, let's say domestic violence, right? Or oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's more through the aid programs. So there have been a lot of investment, of course, for women and girls, uh, different projects, especially there have, there are, for example, shelters in Afghanistan, but it's not run by government. It's uh, run by, it's okay, Maula. There was a question, there was a Maula. Yeah, and I would jump in just to say that there's a system, it's called the informal system in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. that is community mm -hmm. elders or uh, community, I was just going to add about the community elders, Zala, about mm -hmm. shuras and you know that, uh, that a lot of conflict is resolved or dealt with through this um, consensus process among respected and important members of communities. 
Yeah, exactly. So one thing that is, uh, yes, uh, uh, like, uh, for example, just taking an example of shelters, right, in Afghanistan. So, uh, and uh, I give you the example of domestic violence. And, and I saw that at the base also, that a lot of Afghan women, they start like complaining and they start like, kind of raising their voice that I'm being, you know, like my husband is hitting me or my husband is hitting like my kids and they were, he was doing that even in Afghanistan. Why? Because they now feel kind of like that my, whatever I'm like campaigning, it's being heard and there's a support mechanism and you don't have that in Afghanistan. Of course, you didn't have it through government at all because even if their case would have go to a judge or to a court, they would be like, no, you stay with your husband. You know, that's the culture or that's how it should be. And that's how you are a good woman, you know, and uh, or different NGOs uh, that they had different programs for women or it could be for a, uh, for a child being abused or for a woman being abused. Uh, still like the problem was the, the, institution, the, the institutional support was not there at the end, like the law was not supporting like what these angels was trying to do, but at then you have to take the case to the court. So here again, you know, they would face the same like cultural and uh, social um, barriers, you know. To, and, and people uh, are very reluctant to use the yeah, court in Afghanistan, that. of course. Yeah, and here too. Exactly. They're trying to that support. And then as Rachel also said in the presentation, people don't have trust, like they didn't have trust on the government. Uh, and, and it's because they are weak, they are corrupt, and uh, and and it will take um, some time for them even here, you know, to build that trust um, on government or uh, government, um, I mean, um, institutions and U.S. Uh, and, and when it comes to issues of honor, and uh, this is so important because they don't want to even like. There are so many families, educated or not educated, rural or urban, they don't want to go and, um, you know, like it's like considered like a private matter, you know. So if it's out of their home, then it's like, you know, it's like an issue of honor. And if there, there's anything like uh, happens to their honor, then they're all like done. All you know? like it's just something that they cannot take it. Um, so, yeah. I see, Lalit, that you have your your hand up, and uh, <laughs> did you have something to add? Yeah. I... Okay, thank you. Okay, I work at DTA, um, Department of Transition Assistance, and a part of my job is to help the client connect to the resources. Uh, most of the Afghan families come here, they receive, they are on benefit, that means cash assistance, and you all know that cash assistance is for the limited time only. And the parents, if they have children more than two years old, they are required to participate in job search or training or English classes. If the women are not so much supported or they are not allowed to go out in this type of regards, uh, per our agency, they needs to be sanctioned or it is not yet there, but in our pre-COVID uh, situation, if we go pre-COVID or it's coming back, they will be sanctioned. So mm -hmm. is there any way in order to encourage the even the women to participate in any type of activities like the English classes or the job search or the training activities that can be free to free of cost to them so that they will have better future next in the coming days? So I, I don't know what your communication is like with them, but like, as I said, emails or, you know, like a direct person to come and invite someone might have more of an effect. Or if two friends are in, invited to come together, I know that's very labor intensive as opposed to just blasting, you know, an email or, you know, or, or letters that you know, get ignored. It's just a thought that if elders in the community can be, um, can be, um, kind of encouraged to help with some of those things that would have an impact as well. Zala, do you have thoughts about? Yeah, that? exactly. So that's what I wanted to add that orientation uh, for them because Afghans tend to listen to like who, 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 this other Afghan in this other state said so, you know, rather than like really 
uh, following the law or the whatever it's in that state or in that city. They're like, okay, somebody told me that, so they will just follow that. So that's one issue with them. So that's why it's very important to have like direct communication. This is how it needs to be done. If you don't participate in an English class or you don't, you know, attend school or this and that, or you don't do any job, then you will not, you are not eligible for the benefits like after certain uh, months. Um, uh, and as Rachel said, uh, we have a relative who has a daycare in uh, Sacramento and she actually helping a lot of Afghan families that are not literate. So she makes sure that they go to their classes so that they could get the benefit of the, you know, if the county give uh, uh, that money for their kids, you know, to stay at daycare. But the condition is that, that they have to attend the adult classes, the, the evening classes. And she makes sure that that's, that happens. So if you find people like influencers- well, she's an influencer in the community. You know, people in that community, then they can uh, trust her or him and that they listen to her or him. And then, uh, yeah, so that, that's, all, that's very important. We uh, tried a couple of ways, one by the phone and they do not want to speak by then. So they want somebody who's male in the family to speak with other, the stranger. And we tried to get help from the community organizations or the resettlement agency and wanted to have an orientation in their office. Only the male people showed up, not females. So that's a quite a, like a challenging mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's why, like, uh, when we see influencers, somebody that their male family members trust. So this relative, she's a woman, but she talks with the husband, with the wife, you know, with everyone in the family. If they don't allow their wife, she even goes to their family, to their house and talk to them. Um, um, uh, all of that. So, um, yeah, I see Mary, you have your hand Thank up. You. I know we're out of time, but yeah. Yeah, no, I just have a quick comment. So what I'll try to do is I'll send this, um, once I get the recording from Sarah, um, I'll send it out to the offices that have been working with a lot of the, the recent arrivals. Um, and maybe Lely, you know, we can take this back to leadership and sort of see if there's other ways we can troubleshoot, um, you know, communicating with, you know, not just the the head of the household and the families, um, because you know right now we're still sort of in a hybrid model. I mean our offices are open, but our primary form of communication with the clients is by phone. Um, so you know I just wanted to point that out. Okay. No. Yeah. That's yeah. so. That's. But we're going to meet again next Thursday, yeah. I, Wednesday, to um, troubleshoot some more. And yeah, talk yeah, about I, all these issues. So I hope hopefully that'll be helpful. And hopefully I if think, we get the recording to you soon, Mary, then yeah, that would be can great. hop on and ask about specific cases or conversations. Yeah, that would that be great, had. I think. Um, because I think, you know, Lalit, you know, it sounds like you're you're you know doing everything right to um, resolve issues, but maybe you know, asking some really specific questions about like what phrases can we avoid using and which phrases are you know, would, you know, get more traction, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. well, Afghanistan is very much an oral culture as opposed to a, you know, a, a written culture and face-to-face, -face, which is especially hard with this period of COVID. Yeah. I mean, face-to-face -face is how everything works. And so it is, okay. it just makes all the difference. Yeah, and building the trust that's also yeah. like key. Um, uh, once they trust that something that's for my benefit, for my family's benefit, and yeah, I'm not like or my family or my wife or daughters are not being hurt in any way, uh, um, then definitely who doesn't want something that or improve like uh, her, her life or his life? Yeah, so I would say trust building, communication, um, and more like. Um, in most cases they don't know they don't know like okay if i i'm not gonna go to this class i will be not given the benefits and mm -hmm. right so wonderful i, I want to thank you rachel and zala um, for your time and your expertise and uh i've learned i've been working with evacuees since september um and have been to many presentations and i learned many things from this presentation so um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I really look forward to the follow-up um, next, next week. And please spread the word with your colleagues. 
you can bring specific instances you can talk through i mean not identifiable information yeah, exactly. obviously but um but can bring you know specific questions and kind of tease through things with each other and with uh with rachel and zala um, okay will you be sending an invite from the different offices like you did for this training next week or we are going to send it definitely to Mary, and I think Mary, you'll get you'll get that information to them. Yeah, because I would love a copy of this recording. Great, we'll make sure you have it. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you much. All. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye.